Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This morning I uh, touched on a number of developments in the 19th century uh, with an eye more uh, to uh, disclosing some of the ways in which government was never as limited as many people take it to have been at that time. It operated differently in the 19th century, but uh, uh, it, it was not inert. It was not inactive. Uh, this country never had laissez-faire, uh, although uh, the 19th century situation does reveal a much smaller level of government activism than the 20th century by far. So there's certainly a difference, but... Uh, perhaps not as stark a difference as uh, uh, some people believe and uh, some data suggest. So we need to uh, be aware of, uh, of those aspects of, of uh, our history. Uh, they help us to understand better some of the things that continue to take place right up to the present day in this country. I want to uh, now move into the 20th century and uh, talk this afternoon about uh, the so-called progressive era. I've already touched upon this to some extent uh, uh, yesterday when I uh, gave a very quick and dirty sketch of some uh, contours of uh, ideological history in the United States, but I want to... Uh, uh, get into a little more detail about the progressive era and not only deal with uh, some ideological developments, but with some of the uh, economic and uh, political events of that time. Uh, th this is a, a, a critical period of 15, 18 years. Uh, it constitutes, uh, as I've called it, a bridge to modern times. And I've... Uh, I've got a, 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 just a, a, a few names thrown up, not quite at random here, to su suggest some of the uh, landmark personalities uh, that uh, are involved in uh, not only making that transition, but uh, uh, to suggest uh, that it, it took place along two tracks, both with regard to the government's role in foreign policy, the role of the United States in the world, and uh, in domestic policy. So we can think, uh, crudely speaking, of the 19th century as the old regime in the sense that U.S. foreign policy uh, adhered for the most part, not perfectly, but for the most part, uh, to uh, the uh, direction given by uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who advised that uh, the country should, should stay out of uh, foreign uh, quarrels, specifically those of the European nations, uh, with whom we had many uh, ties of commerce and friendship and culture and other things. Uh, uh, no one ever, uh, no one of any importance ever urged isolationism in a, in a literal sense. No one said we should withdraw from the world and be as, as Japan was before uh, Commodore Perry uh, forced them to open up their trade. Uh, we, we had lots of connections, and the Jeffersonians were always glad to have those connections uh, of culture and commerce. Uh, but what they didn't want was the, uh, for the government of the United States to project this nation uh, into the endless intrigues and bloodshed uh, that had marked the history of Europe. He said, we've, we've got plenty to do here. We've got a continent uh, to develop. We've got lives of our own to lead. Let's do that. Let's let these people stew in their own juices, as it were. If they must cut one another's throats, let them attend to it all by themselves. 
and, and so that was, as I say, for the most part, the sort of foreign policy that the United States conducted for more than a century. Uh, now, there were always some people who wanted to get involved in, in uh, foreign affairs militarily or, or in some other way that deviated from Jeffersonian uh, conservatism. Uh, and, and occasionally, uh, something would happen as uh, Jefferson himself uh, authorized uh, naval expeditions to, to uh, suppress Barbary pirates. Uh, so uh, one can certainly, if one tries, go back and create a, a, a fairly long list of uh, events and, uh, and deviations from that uh, general policy stance uh, but uh, I would still insist that they, they are uh, anomalies. Uh, they are exceptions to the general rule of foreign policy. But uh, beginning with the Spanish-American War in 1898, we move into a new era of, of American foreign policy. And from that time forward, uh, the United States has uh, been... Uh, actively, repeatedly, and significantly involved in the uh, military and political affairs of many other parts of the world, and eventually to, to vir virtually all other parts of the world. And no one uh, by the post-World War II period could, could really be immune from some American interest or involvement or intervention or influence of some kind uh, that was carried out deliberately by the U.S. government. So we eventually arrived at uh, global interventionism after World War, I forgot my numbers here, World War II, uh, which put the country in a completely different position than it had uh, been in with regard to foreign policy in the 19th century. And... Uh, and it only gets worse uh, lately. Uh, domestically, uh, we, we never had, as I say, laissez-faire, but we had limited government. Uh, we, we know it was limited because we, we, we know, know now that in the 20th century it got much bigger, much bigger. So uh, it might have been bigger in the 19th century. As I've stressed, there were lots of people seeking government intervention of all kinds in the 19th century. And uh, many of them simply failed to get what they wanted. Uh, they didn't uh, achieve the enactment or implementation of the government policies they, they, they wanted to, to, to do all sorts of things, subsidize various industries, uh, make tariffs even higher than they were already, or uh, provide uh, emergency employment projects for people during industrial slumps. Uh, all sorts of proposals were, were being made all the time for some kind of additional government action in the 19th century, but, but uh, uh, in most cases, no response came forth. And uh, when we look back and say, well, why was that? Uh, why was it that kinds of proposals that seemed to go through much more readily in the 20th century had so much trouble making their way to fruition in the 19th, uh, I've concluded that, that an important part of the answer, uh, probably not the whole of it, but an important part is that the dominant ideology was one at that time that was much closer to what we would call uh, classical liberalism. Uh, many more people had a view uh, of the proper role of government in, in uh, economy and society as, as a, a closely limited role. Uh, and people talked that way. It was something you could read in newspaper editorials. You could even hear members of Congress saying things you'd never hear them say nowadays, such as, uh, we can't do such and such because we can't take money that doesn't belong to the Congress and use it to benefit these people. It's not our money. Well, uh, actually that kind of talk was revived by uh, a few people in the last 20 years in Congress, but they don't mean it. 
The difference was in the 19th century when some guy stood up in the floor of Congress and said that, he really meant it. He said, look, it's not our money. We can't just do anything we think would be nice with that money. It's not ours to, to dispose of that way. We're constrained by the Constitution. This Congress only has certain limited enumerated powers. Well, eventually that kind, that kind of belief system dissolved. And we got the kind of dominant ideology that has, has been uh, friendly to unchecked exercise of government intervention in countless varieties of forms uh, in domestic policy. Now, now, I put up some presidents here who were, uh, as it were, at, at critical junctures of making this transition from the old regime to the modern regime. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, I would call the, the, the mothers of all pernicious 20th century policy, whether it's uh, domestic or foreign. These were really bad guys, any way you slice it. They'd talk about misfortune. Uh, Roosevelt was uh, a psychopath, for starters. I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. The man was a complete nut. Uh, he, uh, he relished uh, uh, killing people. Uh, there's an interesting account of uh, the Spanish-American War when he is uh, described by someone who came upon him dancing a little jig around a dead Spaniard. Well, you cogitate on that one for a while. What kind of a person dances a little jig around a slain human being? Uh, he loved to kill any kind of living creature, uh, an avid hunter, uh, up to and including human beings. So uh, that was one element of uh, his personality. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he was a, a complex figure. He wasn't just a psychopath. He was, he was a, in many ways, a keenly intelligent man, which made him even more dangerous. Uh, he, he, he wrote uh, a great deal. He wrote many books. He was a successful author. Uh, and, and, and they're not bad books. They're not terrible books. You, you go read, read some of that now, and you'll find he, he's quite literate. Uh, he had a flair for writing. He obviously had a keen intelligence at work. Now, you may have problems with the kinds of thoughts he was processing with that intelligence, uh, with some of the values that underlay his views and interpretations, but uh, he certainly was not a dummy. Uh, and he had a, a virtually unbounded lust for power of the kind that demagogues exhibit. He loved public adulation. He loved to hear the people cheering for him. And uh, uh, that's one of the things that makes all politicians so dangerous, that they're that, that sort of person. That they, uh, they get their jollies from leading people because the next thing you know, they're leading them over a cliff. Uh, so there was Roosevelt who, who inadvertently became president in 1901 when, when uh, one of Ralph Rako's conspirators up in Buffalo uh, polished off President McKinley. Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> uh, and he stuck around uh, for the rest of that term and one more, and then he left office, leaving uh, his hand-picked successor, uh, Taft, who proved to be a uh, great disappointment uh, rather quickly. Uh, Taft is also a complex figure, I think, uh, a more admirable man, although not wholly admirable himself. Um, uh, a man of, of judicial temperament, whether you like his judicial doctrines or not, at least that was his temperament. He didn't really like being a politician. So you have to say, well, so far so good. Uh, he, he didn't like campaigning. He didn't particularly get a lot of joy from 
from having public adulation. Uh, he, he was a thoughtful man, I think, and, uh, and eventually he was much happier later on being uh, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court than he ever was being President of the United States. Uh, but, he, but he did advance in some ways the program that Teddy Roosevelt had set in motion. Uh, for example, uh, antitrust prosecution was carried out much more actively uh, on, a, on an annual rate basis under Taft than it had been uh, under Roosevelt. So even though Roosevelt is sometimes described as the trust buster, uh, Taft uh, was a, a more active a prosecutor of antitrust cases uh, than Roosevelt. And, and, and that was not good because, as I suggested this morning, antitrust law was a, was a, a, a dreadful form of law. Uh, it imposed all kinds of uncertainty hanging over the conduct of business, particularly large business in this country. And even though the government in those days had limited enforcement resources, so chances were pretty good if you violated the antitrust laws, you'd get away with it. Uh, uh, still, you didn't know for sure. And if you were unlucky and were prosecuted and, and lost a case in court, it could be uh, extremely costly uh, and per potentially even devastating to your enterprise. So it was, uh, it was not a good thing that Taft was uh, himself a big trust buster. Uh, but Taft looks, uh, looks like something we have sweet dreams about compared to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, if, uh, if, if Teddy Roosevelt was a kind of psychopathic proto-fascist, then uh, Wilson, to my way of thinking, was more akin to Lenin a zealot, a humorless man, so far as his engagement in public affairs went, utterly convinced of his own rectitude. What could be more dangerous than a man in power, utterly convinced of his own rectitude? Uh, that's what we had to deal with with Wilson. Now, Wilson never would have become president in 1912 election, had been elected then, become president the following year, but for uh, Teddy's revived ambition. Teddy, having been out of office and, and, uh, and slain enough uh, large mammals in Africa to carry him for a lifetime, uh, just couldn't stand being out of the public eye, especially when he was so disappointed in the way Taft was carrying on as president. So he, along with uh, some of his uh, uh, politically influential pals, decided that uh, they needed to put him back in office, uh, but it didn't seem to be workable to do that via the Republican Party. So they said, well, if, uh, if that won't work, we'll, just, uh, we'll, we'll take our political football and go home and create the Progressive Party and Teddy Roosevelt will be our candidate, and he'll run and be reelected. We're off and running again. So that's what they did in 1912, and as a result of that uh, uh, political shenanigan, they split the, uh, the non-democratic vote in such a way uh, that Woodrow Wilson uh, got a majority of electoral votes and was elected. Uh, I believe it's... Uh, Popular vote was 43%, if I recall proper, correctly, is in that neighborhood. Uh, I think it was, well, at all events, it was in, in, in that neighborhood. He did not get a majority of the votes, but, uh, but he won in the Electoral College. So when, Roosevelt, uh, when Woodrow Wilson took office, he, he seemed, I think, to many people to be you know, a Democrat of the sort they, they had seen before. He, he had sometimes made noises about believing in, in competition and believing in the market economy and uh, believing in low tariffs and free trade. and uh, that Those seem like a traditional democratic positions. Uh, if you'd actually looked a little more closely into what, what he had to say, for example, by, by reading the collection of speeches published uh, in 1912 called The New Freedom, uh, you would have found that uh, 
Actually, he was not any kind of Grover Cleveland Democrat. Uh, He was already deviating off into much more interventionist directions with regard to domestic policies. Foreign policies, you know, he, he, he didn't have any experience, experience with, and, and nobody seemed to be terribly interested in them in 1912 anyhow. So the election was really decided on the basis of uh, the candidates' positions on domestic policies, and, and, uh, and it was expected, I think, that Wilson would revert to some extent to, to democratic uh, positions. And indeed, in a few ways, he did, such as lowering tariffs uh, in 1913. Uh, but, uh, but he had more in mind. He was already uh, uh, developing a kind of megalomania, uh, and uh, it, it was going to be expressed in domestic policy by making the government a much more decisive arbiter of economic events than it had been before. He, 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 he said in that book I mentioned that, that under modern conditions we can no longer rely on a, a, a government that uh, promotes liberty in the old and negative sense of just leaving people alone. We now have to have a government that, that actively intervenes on behalf of the individual as against powerful Entities such as the trusts. So this was uh, this was more like the kind of demagoguery you were getting from Teddy Roosevelt, who by that time had become a uh, uh, full-fledged fascist who was uh, who was campaigning for complete government control of big business and and was uh, was making terribly menacing noises uh, about almost you know acting as a dictator. Uh, so I guess we should be glad in a way that Teddy didn't have another run, though it's hard to conceive of anything that would have turned out worse all in all than uh, events as they turned out under Wilson. Uh, the great disaster of Wilson, of course, was that he ended up plunging the nation into World War I uh, in a way that uh, affected decisively the outcome of the war. But for American entry, it seems quite likely that the warring powers in Europe would, would have ultimately, in a state of exhaustion, uh, concluded a peace with one another on very different terms than the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which loaded the guilt and uh, heavy reparations uh, liability onto Germany, uh, which busted up four large political empires and, and created a a jerry-built arrangement of new nations and mandates and, and, uh, and divvied up loot between the French, the Italians, and the English, and, and, uh, and created a situation in, in, in which a renewal of the fighting in Europe was well-nigh guaranteed, as many people saw quite plainly at, at the time. Mises wrote about it. Uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote about it. Many people who had heads on their shoulders could look at that treaty and say, this is a disaster. This is guaranteed to, to produce renewed warfare in the future, as, as it did just uh, 21 years later. So that was Wilson. Wilson created the outcome of World War I as it happened I'd say almost single-handedly, if Wilson personally had not decided to ask for a declaration of war, I don't believe the United States would have entered World War I. So, if ever we could blame one man for so much horror, that's the man. Mm -hmm. Well, he had descendants, and a lot of them. And I've just sketched in one of his uh, de- apostles, as it were, uh, Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover himself was uh, something of an author, wrote a number of books. Uh, the last book he wrote was an adulatory book about Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> because he idolized Wilson, as many of the, the people who worked uh, in Wilson's cabinet uh, did. Uh, and uh, he was a Wilsonian. Uh, 
later on, of course, the Democrats tried to, to tar Hoover as a some kind of a callous throwback to old-fashioned laissez-faire Republicans, but that was complete hogwash. He wasn't anything of the sort. He didn't believe in laissez-faire. He believed in all kinds of government active involvement in the economy, business government cooperation of, of various sorts, uh, 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 government assistance to farmers, to industrialists, uh, transportation, banks, so Hoover was anything but a proponent of laissez-faire. In fact, he thought laissez-faire was an outmoded idea and, and the government had to act differently. He, he was very much a Wilsonian uh, in regard to domestic policy. He was somewhat less of a Wilsonian, I think, in foreign policy. Uh, he was not quite so keen to have the United States try to become the arbiter of, uh, of the world's affairs, uh, but again, not a perfect figure. But when we get to FDR, now we get someone who's a full-fledged Wilsonian domestically and internationally. And we get him at the worst possible time, 1933, when we're at the pit of the Great Contraction and many people in this country are desperate for some kind of assistance that they see no way to get except from the federal government. So we'll come to that later on and talk about FDR and his leadership of the New Deal and the U.S. during World War II, which was, which was so, so terribly destructive and prolonged the war, as uh, John Denson will tell us later uh, by his policy of unconditional surrender causing millions of unnecessary deaths. Uh, followed directly by the pygmy Truman, uh, who, uh, strange to say, eventually became a popular, almost mythical figure uh, to the American people. There's just no accounting for the tricks that memory can play. Uh, because when Truman left office in 1953, he was one of the most unpopular uh, people who had ever held the office of the presidency, and for perfectly good reasons. Uh, his uh, administration had been domestically corrupt and, and, and in foreign affairs disastrous, uh, and, and so he deserved all the contempt uh, anyone could heap on him. Uh, but eventually, people looked back somehow and found... Uh, his kind of uh, bluntness uh, so appealing that they overlooked uh, all of these important uh, shortcomings in the man and his policies. But he was kind of a continuation in, in many ways, not every way. I, I've argued elsewhere that uh, at least he wasn't so menacing to the uh, businessmen and investors of the country as the new, new dealers proper had been. And so at least we were able to revive the economy after World War II. But uh, but in but in many respects he he's a follow-on of uh, FDR, and then uh, after some kind of quieter times under uh, Eisenhower, we get this uh, succession of figures, uh, which all need to be lumped together. Uh, in fact, Nixon was in many ways just like these other guys, uh, extreme uh, proponent or at least a tolerator. Uh, domestic activism of all kinds. The wealth, the regulatory state probably took a bigger leap under Nixon than any other president in any four-year period. Uh, and so we have these guys in the 60s and early 70s who, who then put in place the, the, the modern welfare state and uh, up to and including its embeddedness in uh, the medical care system which is proving so disastrous by the day. So this is, this is a kind of overview of figures. Uh, there's a lot more in that story, of course. But, but uh, the, the key here, again, for present purposes, is that we get here via progressivism. Now, one of the things that uh, I was not happy about, and some readers of my book, Crisis and Leviathan, were equally unhappy about, I think, was was that when I discussed progressivism, I, I, I treated this uh, crucial ideological change uh, as exogenous. You know, I say we must recognize these things happened, uh, 
but I didn't give a compelling explanation, even attempt to give uh, an explanation of why. Why was it uh, that progressivism uh, occurred, that, uh, that we moved from the dominant ideology of limited government, which had been in place uh, with some resilience uh, for more than a century, uh, to this very different kind of dominant ideology of, uh, uh, of government activism, both domestically and in foreign affairs. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I have ever arrived at anything I would characterize as a simple explanation. Uh, I have no confidence myself that, that I can put down in a few lines uh, why the, that transition took place. Uh, because I think it has various sources. Uh, what I have tried to do to, to get a better mental grip on it myself is, is to consider the context in which it took place, some of the background, some of the main ideas that composed it, and, and, and try to link all these things together. How do they connect up? Uh, some of them seem, as I, I said yesterday, to be at odds with one another. Uh, progressivism seems in some respects to be internally contradictory. I know it, it's for more politics and for less politics, for example. But, uh, but ultimately, it, it, it's for more statism in, in every dimension. It's just a question of the progressives' view of of the, the mechanisms by which that statism would be brought into play. And uh, this uh, belief that they, they had in expert management, uh, I think, is one of the keys, because that's really different. You don't find in the 19th century anybody to speak of who, who, who touts the idea that we'll all be better off if we have a government expert running things. Uh, in fact, that would have been, I think, viewed almost universally as a preposterous idea in the 19th century. I mean, people recognized that politics happened, that you, you, you couldn't stop it, that sometimes it produced bad outcomes, but, but they didn't say, this is grand. Uh, they didn't say, that's the way to run a railroad, <laughs> to twist an old expression. Uh, they, they would have said, government commission setting railroad rates? Well, what an idiotic idea. What do they know about that? You know, they don't know anything about railroad business. Uh, running banks? Well, we've already been there. That was terrible. They already demonstrated they can't run banks. Uh, running uh, agriculture? Running the manufacturing industry? Stupid. You know, these guys don't know how to run anything. They're just po politicians. All they know how to do is tax and, and make rules and shake people down. That's what politicians do. And some people accepted that. That's like the sun rises in the east. You're going to have politics. Okay? Americans were rarely anarchists. You know, they, they, they very seldom did they say, we've got to eliminate politics. They said, you know, you can't do anything about that except uh, throw the rascals out at the next election or... Uh, or, 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 or maybe keep a closer eye on them or, or, or something of that sort. But, uh, but they certainly didn't often believe that, 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 that they knew what to do to make the world a better place and that if you, if you assign them that task, they would do it. Uh, so in those respects, I think our, our forebears were a lot more astute uh, than, than we have been in the 20th century to fall for uh, the kinds of assumptions we've fallen for. But we got there for a reason. The, the ground was plowed, as it were, prepared in the late 19th century by uh, intellectuals, opinion leaders, uh, people who in some cases, as I mentioned yesterday, had picked up ideas in Europe, especially in Germany, uh, where uh, government uh, control and the early welfare state were uh, much more in evidence. And they had uh, decided that you know, if these uh, highly educated Germans thought uh, these were good ideas, then uh, they must be. So we, we had a, a lot of these uh, young uh, political scientists and historians and economists coming back to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century with their heads full of status nonsense uh, 
they acquired in Heidelberg. And uh, then they had students, and their students had students. And eventually these things began to have a serious uh, impact on the thinking of lots of Americans. Uh, some, of the, some of the figures that, uh, that uh, are, are pretty much forgotten now, people such as Lester Ward, Charles Cooley, Edward Ross, usually called E.A. Ross, uh, these guys wrote books that were big sellers by the standards of uh, academia uh, at the turn of the century, and they trained people at leading universities. Uh, Richard Ely, probably the, uh, the kingpin of them all, uh, taught, for example, John Commons, and then Commons taught a legion of students, uh, including... Uh, a man named Witte, uh, W-I-T-T-E, who was the principal author of the Social Security Act. And if you like, you can track any number of threads like that from a, a, a veritable handful of these uh, German-trained uh, professors in the United States whose students ended up getting involved in policy making. Uh, especially in Wisconsin, where John Commons was uh, the leader of a whole school of thought about government interventionism. Uh, besides uh, Ely and the ones I mentioned, John Burgess, Albion Small, Simon Patton at uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the, these guys were very influential. Simon Patton, for example, was the professor who taught Rexford Tugwell, and Tugwell was one of FDR's brain trust guys in 1932-33, and then he remained in the government later in the 1930s. So, so it's, it's not difficult at all to find out uh, where bad ideas are born. Okay? Heidelberg. <laughs> but they were carried here and disseminated. So that's one thread. And I think it's, a, it's of some importance, although it's sometimes hard to tie down its importance because you, you need more than just an idea. A, a proposal's not enough. This has to be sold. It has to be carried through the political process and so forth. So there's more to it than just uh, some pernicious ideas being imported into the United States. But the point of this is that it was changing the climate of intellectual opinion at leading places. And uh, even people who, who weren't in universities, people like, say, Walter Lippmann, who was very much an intellectual and, and learned at Harvard these kinds of ideas and became a socialist in his early life and a proto-socialist for the rest of his long life, very influential, writing columns way up into the 1960s, uh, conspiring with politicians and diplomats all along the way. This guy had tremendous influence, and he's simply one more of this group uh, who, who are shaping uh, political action and moving it in the direction of collectivism and away from, from the old regime. Hmm? So, uh, Irving Fisher, uh, John Dewey, everybody's heard of John Dewey because he's the guy who, who did more to destroy education uh, than anybody else by propounding very bad ideas uh, that were wildly popular among people who, who went to teacher's college for decades. Uh, uh, these guys, besides being uh, collectivistly uh, inclined, uh, along the lines of the German-trained professors, also uh, had another trait that was coming into play here, and that, that is that, the, that they came out of the post-millennial pietist religious uh, channels uh, in, in which uh, the dogma includes the idea that, that we have an obligation to God to, to bring about the heaven on earth, that, uh, that Christ isn't going to come and then produce heaven on earth. We're going to produce it, and then Christ will come back. So if that's your, if that's your religious tenet, uh, you're motivated to get out there and uh, start creating heaven on earth, and these people believe that you, the power of the state would be mighty useful in helping to do that. 
So uh, Murray Rothbard has written a, a great deal about the influence of post-millennial pietism. And I, I commend to you uh, uh, his writings uh, on that topic. He, he knew more about it than anybody I've uh, run across. Uh, so we, we, we've got, as it were, on, intellectuals on one side, but they're not separate from these religiously inspired currents going on at the same time. Uh, tied up with movements that go way back in the 19th century, such as prohibition of alcohol, uh, prohibition of Sunday trading, uh, blue laws, uh, uh, various schemes to force people to be more virtuous than they'll be if left alone. Uh, and eventually, uh, these ideas were also carried into, into practice in the form of the Prohibition Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. A uh, very curious kind of thing to have a constitutional amendment about, but, but it was done, and of course we all know how that worked. Uh, and we learned so much from it that we've been duplicating it for the last 40 years with another substance with, the, I would say, even more disastrous effect. Uh, but we're not giving it up. So once again, there's evidence that people are getting stupider as time passes, not smarter. What happened to, uh, to the theory of evolution? I took a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> well, this is kind of intellectual uh, and popular religious uh, background that feeds into uh, the... Uh, progressivism proper that we get to between 1900 and 1918. And uh, this is occurring in a socioeconomic context that I think uh, is no longer very familiar to, to people, and even historians, I think, lose track of what, what it was like in, in that period. Uh, the economy was growing rapidly, so sometimes people think, well, everything was hunky-dory. We were having rapid economic growth. But if you go back and look at the actual year-to-year -year records, what you find is that the, the growth of the U.S. economy in that period was extremely erratic. We'd have a year when, when, when GDP, real GDP, would grow 10% in one year. And then we'd have a year when it didn't grow at all. Uh, or a year of 5% growth followed by actual fall in GDP. I mean, the, on the average, uh, the economy was growing 3 or 4% a year in that period. But the average doesn't mean anything because the variance was so great. And <clears throat> the importance of that was that this created a lot of uncertainty and apprehension. It made people nervous about what the future held, correctly so. Is it, you know, even if you can expect, for example, demand for your product to grow and you're in business, well, if it collapses next year, you could be wiped out. One bad year is plenty in a lot of business situations. So businessmen were nervous. A lot of ordinary people were nervous. They never knew when their employer might lay them off, uh, when they might have trouble finding another job uh, nearby. Uh, so this was a this was a time when many people were were more apprehensive than you might think uh, from the trends that characterized it. Financial panics uh, happened every few years. Uh, banks would close. Uh, depositors would be running down to get their money out and and unable to do so, and, and that would put them in in a, a difficult situation because they couldn't pay the debts they owed and so forth. So, so people were worried about the financial condition of the country. Not least of the warriors were the bankers themselves uh, because they didn't like the setup they had at that time. Uh, many business people had been badly stung by the depression of the 1890s and it was foremost in their mind throughout this whole progressive period that uh, a lot of businesses had gone bankrupt in the mid-90s. Uh, even those that hadn't gone bankrupt had lost money for years on end in many cases. And so uh, 
They, they knew something was wrong. They said something about this economic setup we have here is not giving us good results if we, if we have events like that Great Depression we just had. And now when we, even now when we look back, it's the second worst depression of American history. Uh, unemployment rates for industrial employees probably got as high as 30 or 35 percent at times in the 1890s. So it was, it was a, a, a terrible slump, uh, and it put a lot of business people and bankers in a frame of mind to look around for reforms of some kind. And we can, in fact, draw uh, not a straight line, but a fairly direct line from that depression and people's responses to it through a number of uh, meetings of uh, bankers and others interested in financial reform, and ultimately leading up to the creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. So financial instability, economic instability, uh, labor relations were, were horrible at this time. Uh, uh, not just that there were strikes, the, there were uh, strikes fairly frequently in some industries. Uh, not a great many workers were organized into unions then, not even 10% of the whole labor force belonged to labor unions, but in some industries, such as mining uh, and the railroad industry, uh, lots of people did belong to unions. And in, in some places, such as out in the western part of the country, uh, there were very radical unions, like the Industrial Workers of the World, which was a, a, almost a radical socialist organization more than a labor union. I believe it was more syndicalist than socialist. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fair description. But uh, the, thing, the thing that uh, scared people about the wobblies, as people called them, was, was that the, the violence often followed them around. And they didn't always instigate it either, but they weren't, they weren't afraid to respond in kind. And so there were events every once in a while, such as the, uh, the governor of, I guess it was uh, Idaho, who, who walked out of his house one morning and was blown to smithereens by dynamite. Uh, that was not an accident. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, on more than one occasion, uh, police or the militia would be brought out and would gun down some of these people. Uh, there was a massacre in uh, Centralia, Washington, before World War I, or uh, maybe it was just after, actually, uh, around the World War I period. And right up the road from where I used to live, in north of Seattle in Everett, there was another great massacre involving the Wobblies who, who showed up on a boat from Seattle and were met by the mill owners and their, their local sheriffs and thugs, uh, heavily armed, and, and they had a huge gunfight right there on the wharf. So this is, this is what we call labor relations in the progressive era. Uh, but that is not quite the way we model it in neoclassical economics. You know? and, it, and it made a lot of people apprehensive. In 1914, probably the worst episode was out in Ludlow, Colorado. There was a big mining camp, and the miners went on strike. Rockefeller owned this operation, and so they got the state militia in there, and they, and they got them in complete with machine guns. And they set up their weaponry, and they set this tent city where the strikers were living on fire and proceeded to, to burn a bunch of the people to death, including women and children, and to shoot down some of the others. And, and they inspired more than a week of civil war right there between the state authorities and the striking miners. Well, something else to make people nervous, to make them think, maybe there's a reform that's needed here. Maybe capitalism, at least in this form, isn't working. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to suggest the kinds of contexts in which progressivism developed and to suggest to you that, that this was not a golden age. This was a period in which a lot of uncertainties ha were hanging over people and putting them in a frame of mind to look for some more secure arrangement. Okay? If there's one promise that government makes to people, it's that they're the ultimate provider of security. And so here were a lot of Americans feeling insecure and therefore becoming more amenable <coughs> to some proposal uh, 
to use government power in a way that would enhance their security. Okay? Uh, that's, the, that's the ultimate good deal people want from government. It never gets it, but uh, it's always uh, a deal they're willing to consider. Uh, immigration rates were very high at this time. On average, about a million foreigners entered the country every year. Now, the population of the United States in 1900 was 76 million. So to put that in context, that's a, more than 1% being added to the population by, by gross immigration flows every year. What year? Uh, be, between 1900 and 1914. When the war started, the shipping wasn't available and the immigration flows almost stopped. But, but uh, up until the war, there was heavy immigration every year. Uh, it fell back a great deal during the Depression years because uh, word passed very quickly between Europe and the United States. And so people knew uh, there's no point moving to Pittsburgh in 1908 because there's no work to be had there. The decade from 1900 to 1909 is the highest percentage of immigration to the United States in our history. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, what this did, uh, again, was create situations in many of the big cities of the East and the Northeast uh, where, where, where people found life more uncertain. Not just the immigrants. Of course, they, they frequently didn't know what was going on and didn't speak the language. Uh, didn't know the local rules and customs and laws. Uh, but uh, the local people didn't know what to expect from all these newcomers. You know, what kind of people were they? Could you, could you work with them? Could you trust them? Could you, could you hire one in your business? If you did, how would you, how would you give orders? Uh, what, would, what would you expect from them? Now, of course, the market was ingenious about working out ways to incorporate these people. And lots of people became essentially middlemen and translators and, and what have you. So there was a, a huge number of institutional innovations that came forth to accommodate the assimilation of all of these strangers into American society. And I think in retrospect, we'd have to say that they, they, they worked quite well. But that didn't mean they worked instantaneously or that they always worked. And so there were, there were conflicts, ethnic conflicts, uh, that, that uh, took place uh, throughout uh, the industrial areas of America and in these, uh, even in the West in places with mining and lumbering camps, uh, employments of that sort. That was another part of the context. And then there was, on top of this, as I mentioned earlier this morning, the growth of big business, which continued during the Progressive Era quite rapidly, and uh, had a lot of people scared, particularly small business people who were apprehensive that they'd be able to meet the competition. Yeah. By that time, we, we not only had big manufacturers and big utilities and big railroad companies, but we were even beginning to see such things as big retailers, uh, people like the mail order uh, sellers, the Montgomery Ward and, and Sears, that uh, were starting to provide serious competition to a lot of small storekeepers in rural areas because they, they, they offered low prices and they delivered reliably and, and so they were serious competitors and people didn't want to go down to the local store and pay 50% more. So, so this kind of uh, uh, development of big business was occurring as well. So in, in this context, uh, uh, schemes to have the government do something that looked as if it would provide more security or hold in check some of these emerging threats gained a new credibility and more political support among the public and, 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 and thence among uh, representatives in legislatures and in Congress. In 1903, uh, now we've got Teddy Roosevelt as president, uh, his sort of desire to dictate to big business uh, took the form of the creation of something called the Bureau of Corporations. Uh, this was the beginning of any kind of general interest at the federal level in uh, overseeing the big business. We already had the ICC, uh, which is so-called Independent Regulatory Commission, uh, but the Bureau of Corporations was a part of the uh, executive uh, uh, division of the federal government, and uh, 
and it didn't have great ambitions, uh, although some people wanted to go so far as even having a federal license for uh, corporations doing interstate business. That, that didn't go through. But the Bureau of Corporations was supposedly going to discipline big business by collecting information about business and disseminating it to the public so that the power of public opinion would be mobilized if, if businesses were behaving badly. Uh, the Bureau of Corporations is the, the germ from which we then got later on the uh, Department of Commerce and Labor, which evolved into the Department of Commerce, which is sort of the government's uh, busybody subsidy office uh, that we have to put up with now as well. So this is where it began. Uh, the antitrust laws didn't satisfy a lot of people, not just the businessmen who had to endure the uncertainty, but uh, others as well. <clears throat> and eventually they were amended in 1914. The Clayton Act was an amendment to the Sherman Act and uh, tried to clarify a little bit exactly what the reach of the antitrust laws uh, were, what things were uh, criminal and what things were not. Uh, I don't know that it provided a great deal of clarification, but it moved in that direction perhaps. At the same time, the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act was passed, and that created uh, another commission uh, sort of duplicating what was being done already by the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, which was looking into, into anti-competitive actions by business. And uh, so we've been stuck with uh, that outfit for the last 89 years as well. Again, creating more uncertainty for businesses. You never know when FTC might, might come down on you with some kind of complaint. and You'll have to deal with it and perhaps even be penalized when uh, the dust has settled. In 1906, the uh, two laws were passed having to do with security of food and drug supply, uh, the Meat Inspection Act, uh, and the uh, Food and Drug Act, sometimes called the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Uh, these, these are interesting in various regards. In some ways, they, they're, 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 they're quite typical of, of progressive uh, lawmaking in the sense that they, they were preceded by quite a lot of muckraking journalists exposing uh, supposedly terrible practices, uh, especially in meatpacking plants where unsanitary uh, conditions were being tolerated and contaminated uh, products were being marketed and, and what have you. Uh, much of this was fiction, literally fiction, such as Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, which may have had the biggest impact of any of the muckraking, but some of it purported to be reporting as opposed to to fiction, but uh, I, I think much of it was bad reporting. Uh, later on, it, it became fairly clear that that the worst offenders in this regard were not the big meatpacking companies. Indeed, they were probably the best performers, but the worst offenders were the little fly-by-night outfits <laughs> uh, who were usually able to escape any kind of supervision whatsoever. Uh, but even they were disciplined by market competition, so I, d I don't want to make too much of, of their sins. At all events, the legislation was misdirected. Uh, both of these acts were, however, also typical of progressive legislation in that they are not what they seem. Historians used to write about them uh, in a very naive way. They'd say... Uh, the capitalists were, were committing sins. Uh, the muckrakers discovered it and told the public. The public demanded that the government clean up the mess, and they did, and they passed these laws end of story. Well, <clears throat> actually, there was a long, long background to the Food and Drug Act, for example, that involved lobbying and politicking uh, and uh, organizing going back at least to the 1880s and particularly central to this background was one Harvey Wiley, uh, who started out in the 1880s in a position uh, 
uh, called The Chemist of the Department of Agriculture. And uh, it's interesting, The Chemist. They had only one in those days. That's why they're known as the good old days. But, uh, but Harvey Wiley was an ambitious bureaucrat. He was kind of a model for bureaucrats everywhere at all times. He wanted to expand his power. He wanted to build the size of his bureau and his budget and the scope of its actions. And so he worked tirelessly, never gave up. And he realized that if he was ever going to get anywhere, he needed powerful allies in the political process. So uh, he went out and allied himself over the years, especially with sugar producers uh, who, were, who were concerned about competition from the saccharin, which is an artificial sweetener that had come into use in the late 19th century, uh, and, uh, and whiskey producers who were fighting against uh, rectified whiskey uh, as opposed to whiskey aged in barrels the old-fashioned way. And, uh, and so Wiley, uh, although he was an ambitious bureaucrat, was also a bit of a nut. Uh, he, believed, he believed in purity. Uh, it always makes me think of the, uh, the, uh, the, the code phrase in Dr. Strangelove, you know, purity of essence. Uh, Wiley seems to have really believed in that idea. Uh, because he, he had the notion that only certain foods were pure and ought to be consumed by human beings. They were the natural ones, sugar, say, as opposed to the impure or artificial ones, saccharin. Uh, I don't know how, quite how he got the idea that old-fashioned whiskey was pure and rectified whiskey not, but he did. Uh, and, and same with butter and margarine. He tied himself up with the butter producers who were concerned about competition from the margarine producers. Uh, margarine was impure. In fact, federal government actually placed a tax on, an excise tax on margarine in the late 19th century, of all things. Uh, and uh, states had laws that wouldn't allow producers to color it yellow. Uh, they had that for ages, in fact. In my lifetime, you could still buy white margarine and you got a little package of coloring when you bought it, and you could take it home and mix up the coloring with, the, with this white stuff <laughs> and make it look like butter. Uh, but that was all because of government uh, regulation. And Wiley joined forces with these uh, protection-seeking manufacturers, and they lobbied Congress year after year after year uh, to get a law enacted that would basically outlaw or somehow penalize these impure foods. And uh, ultimately, that law they got in 1906 uh, with the Food and Drug Act, uh, which uh, began fairly innocently, almost as a labeling law. It required producers of, pro pro of drugs and processed foods to reveal their ingredients and to say exactly what was in the package and not to say something was in there that wasn't in there. So that didn't seem like too burden, burdensome a, a law at the time. But again, it was a foot in the door. And from that beginning, uh, the power of the federal food and drug regulators grew and grew and grew uh, from episode to episode as some big public health disaster took place involving uh, particularly uh, drugs that uh, might kill a lot of people. Uh, so eventually we got a kind of a draconian regulation of food and drugs in this country. It goes back to the progressive era. Okay. Well, let me say uh, a, a little about one more kind of progressive uh, uh, attempt to get security. And, 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 and this is one that, that has resonance for those of us who who still remember uh, well the events of the 1970s. In the 1970s, many people became concerned with, uh, with running out of raw materials, with energy insecurity. Okay? Remember how Nixon and uh, Carter and those guys used to try to sell the country on their energy policies as national security issues? Okay? Uh, and people still talk like this sometimes. We, we're reliant on the Persian Gulf for oil, people claim, and therefore we're at risk. It's a national security thing. We have to kill all the Arabs. Uh, some 
such non sequiturs rarely far behind. Well, a lot of people in the late 19th century and even more in the progressive era began to fear. We're always dealing with fear here, I reiterate. Fear is the best thing to use if you want to do something in politics. They began to fear and to try to persuade other people to fear that we were going to run out of various natural resources. And one reason we were going to run out of them is because currently they were being used unwisely. Uh, by whom? Oh, by their owners. Uh, by, for example, people who owned forest land and had the audacity to go onto that land and cut the trees down and turn them into to lumber. Uh, now, in the process of doing so, they sometimes used the methods that, in, in, in a very naive or vulgar sense, seemed to be wasteful. They might not cut all the trees, for example. They might cut only certain sizes. Uh, they might not process the wood very carefully, so they might build up a huge amount of, uh, of byproduct that they then set afire. Uh, I remember when I was a kid going up into Northern California and Oregon and Washington, all these lumber mills used to have these, these uh, funny-looking teepees uh, where they would burn sawdust and, and waste wood from the lumber mills. And you never, I never see that anymore. Maybe it's because they've moved all the timber making to Canada. <laughs> but at all events, that was the sort of thing that some of these early conservationists would see, and they'd say, well, look at that good product going to waste. Okay. Uh, they were very much attuned to the physical fallacy of waste. When they thought of waste, they thought of stuff, of things they could see being not used for any productive purpose. Ergo, they thought they were seeing waste. What they didn't understand, and indeed what conservationists to this very day have never understood, is that waste has everything to do with value. <laughs> it's not being appropriated. With value. And that when we talk about something that has value not being used, because it would be more costly to use it than to let it go to, quote, waste, that's not really waste at all. That's economic behavior. So if some guy in Wisconsin or Minnesota cut all the trees on his woodlot, it might look as if somehow they were devastating nature's bounty. But what these guys understood perfectly well was that from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast, there were countless thousands upon thousands of acres of perfectly good trees waiting to be cut at fairly low cost in many places. And it didn't make a lot of sense to use German conservation methods in Wisconsin. It wasn't worth the cost of the resources required to do it. If you wanted to replace the wood you just cut down in Wisconsin, go to Colorado and cut some trees there. <laughs> now, you didn't have to explain this to lumbermen. They knew this already. That was their business. But the conservationists looked at the cutover district of the northern Midwest, uh, uh, upper Michigan, of Wisconsin, of Minnesota, and they said, look, they're wrecking this place. They're just destroying it. We've got to stop them somehow. Capitalism is just raping the land. They, 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 they thought any number of other resources were going to be overused, misused, used up as well. Uh, let me read you just a brief section from a, a book written by one of the leading early conservationists, Gifford Pinchot, uh, uh, an important uh, progressive figure, uh, and he wrote in this 1910 book, we have a limited supply of coal, and only a limited supply. 
Whether it is to last for 100 or 150 or 1,000 years, the coal is limited in amount. Unless through geological changes, which we shall not live to see, there will never be any more of it than there is now. But coal is, in a sense, the vital essence of our civilization. If it can be preserved, if the life of the mines can be extended, if by preventing waste there can be more coal left in this country after we of this generation have made every needed use of this source of power, then we shall have deserved well of our descendants. And later on in the same book, he wrote, the five indispensably essential conditions or materials of our civilization are wood, water, coal, iron, and agricultural products. We have timber for less than 30 years at the present rate of cutting. (laughs) 1910. The figures indicate... Expert speaks. The figures indicate that our demands upon the forest have increased twice as fast as our population. We have anthracite coal, but for 50 years, and bituminous coal for less than 200. Our supplies of iron ore, mineral oil, and natural gas are being rapidly depleted. And many of the great fields are already exhausted. Mineral resources such as these, when once gone, are gone forever. Well, uh, you can take this passage unchanged and insert it 20 years later, 50 years later, (laughs) or tomorrow, and you'll find somebody willing to sign at the bottom. Okay? This is what conservationists slash environmentalists have been saying from the beginning. Uh, They've been talking about misuse, uh, uh, waste, uh, all subscribing to physicalist fallacies, uh, and all proposing that the answer to this dire problem is government control of natural resources. Now, this control had already begun to be expressed as early as 1891, when the federal government first created forest reserves, which is to say it took some of the areas that were still in the public domain, and it said, we're never going to sell these or let somebody come in and use them. These are going to be set aside as protected forest reserves. 1891 was the beginning of the forest reserve system, Uh, That would be President Harrison's term, although I don't know that he had much personally to do with this. Uh, But but this was something that Teddy Roosevelt latched onto and made one of his uh, political claims to fame. And he was uh, the great conservationist. He was going to save our natural resources from rapacious capitalists. And again, this fits right into the to the atmosphere of thinking in the progressive era. Uh, So Roosevelt uh, greatly expanded uh, the number of forest reserves uh, from 41 that existed in 1899 to 159 uh, when he left office, uh, which increased the area from 46 million uh, to 150 million acres in forest reserves. And later on, even more land was added. And and you can find people today that want to set aside still more forest land uh, to be uh, overseen, controlled by the federal government. Now, countless forest economists have demonstrated that the government's management of these lands is a disaster, that it gives them negative value. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying it reduces their value. I'm saying it makes them worthless. The costs being incurred are greater than the benefits being yielded. And if you add that up over a stream of future years, you get a gigantic negative current present value for what the government is getting out of this property. It's squandering the property. It's been squandering it all along. These were senseless reserves in the beginning. Uh, Forests were vast in 1908 in this country. There, There was no running out of wood. 
Uh, forestry companies know perfectly well how to replant forests when it pays to do so, and some of them eventually began to do that when it made economic sense. But meanwhile, the government insisted on embedding itself in the whole management of the forest, and not just the forest, but a lot of other natural resources as well. Uh, but we have these progressives and the progressive conservationists to thank uh, for this kind of policy uh, which has uh, become characteristic of modern environmentalism along the way. Well, let me uh, stop at this point. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in this session, and we have more time now for uh, questions. Don't confine yourself if you want to ask about some other topic that's come up uh, in the past four sessions. Uh, ask anything you feel like or, or make comments. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you quoted uh, Woodrow Wilson from a book, uh, I think you said you had previously mentioned, but I didn't catch the title. It's called The New Freedom. The New it Freedom. was really a collection of speeches that he gave uh, in 1912 when he was angling to become president. Okay. Who was it edited by? Do you know? uh, I don't know that it even has an editor. I think it's just back-to-back uh, -back essays, as I remember. The last section you mentioned in the book about the evolution of the jurisprudence of the Sherman Act. Yes. Uh, would you give the title of that again? Yes, uh, I will. Uh, Martin Sklar is the uh, author's name, S-K-L-A-R. And uh, the title of that book is The Corporate Reconstruction of American Capitalism. <laughs> Sklar is uh, a, a, one of the members of the quasi-Marxist corporate capitalism school of history writing. And uh, what does that mean? it means that uh, it means these are not exactly full-fledged Marxists. They don't spout the, you know, the full panoply of Marxist doctrine. But uh, they use a species of class analysis that clearly springs directly from Marxism. Uh, and they, uh, they don't understand much of anything about how markets work. Uh, they have uh, crude, very crude ideas at best. Sklar himself actually ends up going wrong, partly because he did look at some neoclassical economics and learn all the wrong lessons. So he comes away arguing uh, that uh, what business was trying to do, uh, big business in the progressive era, was uh, find a way to administer prices. Uh, that's an expression that goes back particularly to, to Berlian means in the early 1930s. Administered prices meant sort of fi prices fixed by the businesses themselves or by trusts or combinations of businesses. At all events, not competitive prices somehow administered, and he, he's got the idea that uh, whether businesses set prices, uh, big business sets the price, or the government sets the price, it's just different ways of administering the price. So he, he's basically an ignoramus when it comes to understanding the working of markets, but, but, but in other ways he's a meticulously careful historian. And as I said, his reading of the jurisprudence of the Sherman Act is superior to anything I know. So uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to give him his due. If you happen to be interested in other aspects of, of his work, it's, it, it's a huge work, very interesting about the politics of the progressive era. He goes through all of the presidents and tracks the major policy making and gives a lot of detail about who did what, who said what, who conspired with whom. So I actually recommend this book, despite what I've, I've said about it. Uh, uh, I wrote an essay, actually a kind of review essay about it, in, in, a, in a journal called Critical Review in, in 1992. And my essay is called Origins of the Corporate Liberal State. And uh, I believe it's online at, at onpower.org if, you, if you'd like to look it up. Yes, sir. So basically, this uh, Sklar fellow belongs to a school of thought that uh, uses a semi-socialist framework but doesn't spout any crap about dialectical materialism or anything? Uh, 
He's got a kind of not exactly dialectical materialism, but he's got no, no, again something. But he's got something that verges on it. <laughs> he's got he's got ideas about how historical change is brought about by sort of uh, changing forces of production and those uh, giving uh, life to political pressures and there, therefore bringing into being new property relations. Uh, that's all. I mean, uh, it's, it, it's as if you're having, you're having a dream of Marx, but it's a fuzzy dream. Uh, then you know it's really Sklar you're dreaming about uh, because it's not r- really Marx, but it's so Marxian in flavor and tone that uh, you can't quite shake the feeling that you're in that other dream. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, the apprehension that you talked about in the early 1900s, like uh, the Wobblers and the, the Rockefeller violence and whatnot, yeah. um, those all seem to be like exogenous and outside of any, anything fueled directly by the government, whereas today's apprehension of terrorism and the drug war and yeah. big, scary cigarette companies and whatnot are all, right. all pretty much fueled by <laughs> the federal government. What do you think about yeah. that? Well, I think I think it's certainly the case that the government is much better equipped nowadays to keep the pot boiling. Uh, I I wrote a little piece a few years ago in which I I, I just listed all the members of the uh, turned out to be the Reagan administration because I pulled this uh, this federal guidebook off my shelf, and it went back to the 80s when Reagan was president. <clears throat> it's one of these places where you can look up who is who in the, in the government and uh, what positions they occupy formally. And, and uh, in the Reagan administration, there were <clears throat> dozen or more of these deputy assistant under-somethings for something, <laughs> all of whom were basically spin doctors. I mean, it just... Hosts of these guys, highly paid on the federal payroll, and they exist in every department. It's not just in the, in the executive office of the president. They're everywhere. The government has equipped itself over time to constantly feed disinformation to the public to promote, well, itself. That's what it's promoting. It's drumming up uh, business uh, demand, artificial demand for what it purports to supply. Uh, some form of service or security to the public. Uh, that didn't exist in Teddy Roosevelt's day. Uh, politicians made speeches, and, uh, but they didn't have vast staffs of flax running around uh, telling tall tales like that. So you had, hey, you had to do your own dirty work uh, more directly if you were a politician in those days. Uh, that's, this apparatus is pretty much something that has developed since the New Deal. Giant bureaucracies. Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, they do so much advertising that the media is almost beholden to them because if all of a sudden they says, we're not going to give you our anti drug laws or our yeah. whatever. Right. You'll go broke. Yeah. I, I, I have an exercise I suggest to the reader. <laughs> uh, sometime when you listen to the news just keep a tally as you go along of the stories and, and note how many of them uh, go to sources in the government okay? is it you know, the president's press spokesman is it, is it Joe Blow at the Department of Defense you know, who, where do these stories come from and I think you'll find that the majority of what pretends to be news nowadays is nothing but propaganda being propagated through the mouthpieces of uh, people who pretend to be journalists. But they're just retelling the tale. Uh, and and uh, because they're supposed to be independent, we're supposed to believe that's credible once they repeat it. Uh, but they're, they're carrying away press releases and they're carrying away uh, leaks uh, that are given to them, and uh, they are indeed beholden because if if they cross their masters, uh, 
they'll get cut off. They won't get any more leaks. They, they won't even be treated civilly. They, they, they won't be called upon in a presidential press conference. Uh, every once in a while, some, something happens. The mic is on when the president doesn't know it, you know, and he, he makes some crack about you know, a jerk over there. You know, I'm never going to call on him. Uh, uh, so it's just a fact of life that uh, that's the way journalism operates in the era of massive government. That that the news media, not entirely, of course, there are all kinds of fringy uh, news sources uh, in existence, and thank goodness for the internet because we can all get at them now. But the uh, the major media are, I believe, uh, pretty much just unofficial arms of the government. Yeah, they, all their stories, or all their main stories, seem to either involve one of the government's already ongoing wars against, you know, social crusades wars against one thing or another, mm -hmm. or there's something that the media wants to extend. The, 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 if it's not about that, if it's in the private sector, mm -hmm. then it's something that calls for mm -hmm. intervention or mm -hmm. calls for further regulation. I also like to keep a tally of the, of the uh, fright du jour uh, <laughs> If you check uh, CNN's headline news, for example, just about every half hour you'll see, you know, what is today's announcement of some horrible thing that may be killing us in the food or the water or the, uh, you know, the birds flying over or who knows where it could be. But, but, but actually the government is looking into it. So. <laughs> this will be dealt with. It's not just the news, though. It's crossed over into pure entertainment media too because um, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Drug Policy Offices were um, betting scripts from network entertainment shows and giving money, uh, providing support to TV shows that towed the line on uh, their anti-drug policies. So it's, you know, yeah, uh, in some ways I guess it's better, at least it's, that's actually fiction. You know? <laughs> Uh, it's probably worse, I think, because it's more insidious. This, this, this kind of the government uh, disinformation uh, has its origins, I think, in this country in wartime. Uh, during World War I, the government went to great lengths to, uh, to feed its line uh, to one and all. Uh, the movies, the theater, the school teachers, uh, uh, preachers, uh, you name it. And then in World War II, uh, they operated a little more subtly, but similarly, uh, and they worked through the movie industry, uh, up to and including, or maybe I should, should say down to and including, cartoons, in which cartoon figures were, uh, were talking about uh, the importance of paying their income tax and uh, obeying price regulations uh, and buying bonds, of course. Uh, so... So the wars have been uh, real uh, schools uh, for government uh, manipulation and control of media, including entertainment media. Lou? Well, I was just going to say, starting in the late 30s, Hollywood started to make movies about the, uh, the magnificent British heroes <laughs> of the empire, the greatest of Queen Victoria, the greatest uh, of uh, uh, British troops in India, and yeah. all the glories of British civilization. Right. Preparing us to uh, be their allies in the Fourth Coming War. Yeah, well, thank goodness we've now got a, a, a new generation reminding us of the glories of the British Empire and our duty to to uh, to recreate it. <laughs>